Hello everyone, Kick here, back with another video. If you guys are back to you with part 7 of the Sheriff's Handbook, once again I'll leave a link to this down in the description box below. Follow me for email. You can email us at the moneygymo.com private consultation. Without further ado, let's see if we can finish this up. History of the Common Law The following are excerpts from The Excellence of the Common Law by Brent Winners. You can find Brent and his books at www.commonlawyer.com he also teaches and he also teaches and answers questions every monday night at 9 p.m est midnight visit nationallibertyalliance.org slash monday call for details to join our open forum we in america have escaped the fascination of totalitarianism because we have in our tradition other elements the refusal refusal of the Hebrews to confuse God with the world. We also have in our tradition Christ, and we have in our tradition the church where clearly human values were neither united nor total and were, op and were opposed to the state. America is under common law. The common law tradition has neither emerged out of nor evolved from the Roman civil law. The notion that the common law evolved from the civil law is a hidden danger to common law liberties and protections. The foundations of these two legal traditions are wholly distinct, producing vastly different results. Inevitably, fulminating full, full, full persistent conflict among nations. The common law traces its roots as far back as the Anglo Saxon tribes. Beyond these tribes, evidence can be scant, rendering tracing of the common law's ancient principles difficult. Israel was the first common law nation. The earthly ruler as king was, requi was required to be subject as an individual as well as king to God and the law. The shitty of supremacy ultimately was vested in God. The law under the, under the garden, guardianship of the priests at the central sanctuary was so vital to the king in Israel that he was instructed to make a written copy for himself. By his observance of this law, he would learn to fear and revere God in his, in his own life. Anglo-Saxon Limited Government The root idea of our constitution is that man can be free because the state is not. The Anglo-Saxon earls elected that each of their kings and permitted these kings to rule only with their consent and by their advice. The modern British have abandoned these standards. The British monarchy although relatively powerless, has become decidedly her hereditary. America's founders, on the other hand, harked, ba harked, back, to to harked back to Angelo Saxon's ancient standard requiring election of her president and allowing his authority only within the advice and consent of the Senate. Our American common law tradition also harks back to the Saxons. We also elect sheriffs, coroners, tax assessors and judges locally, and cast votes for state governor and national president. History has preserved the minutes of council meetings of kings and earls during the times of Alfred the Anglo-Saxon. Consequently, we are, not, we are not ignorant concerning the nature of common law principles practiced in Anglo-Saxon England. When an Anglo-Saxon king died, the assembly of earls called the Witten often but not always, appointed a member of the deceased king's family to, to succeed him. The, Wit the Witan was the assembly of wise. The name Witan is the white-headed wise elders. Witan derives from the Anglo-Saxon Witan, referring to the hoary heads of the mature men. The white age Mott was a board of elders and, at least in theory, wiser men. The Anglo-Saxons called the early tribal law the Vorkirit. Translated into literal, literal English folk, folk right. People's law or folk law. Folk, folk law. The folk right was held in common among the Germanic tribes and more particularly for purposes of the common law. The folk right tradition was a law of the angels, the Saxons, the Jutes, Danes, and even the Celts all having migrated at various times from the continent. The advent 
of the, the advent of the written word of God among the Anglo Saxons in England brought a desire to read and then to write. Reading was, reading was necessary in order to discern the mind of God through his written scriptures. God's word encouraged writing so men may copy and translate the scriptures. Writing also enabled the production of the Lex Cilicia, the earliest known record of Anglo-Saxon folk law issued on the European continent under King Clovis following his, com his con conversion to Christ in AD 4 496. The earliest written complication of the Anglo-Saxon folk right, folk law, in England was issued by Ethelbert, the Christian king of Kent, at about 865 A.D. The common law reflects scriptural. The common law receives scriptural stability. The pagan Anglo-Saxons discovered and put into practice the elements of the common law, following their migration to the British island. The word of God nurtured these precepts and replaced their false gods with the God of Scripture. The mind of fallen man is dark, but even so, man can discern what is right, although he is powerless of himself to practice it persistently. C.S. Lewis observed that when, he, when men demand right behavior in others, even though they neglect to behave the right themselves, they prove that the potential to know the law dwells naturally in their unregenerate natures. God has stamped the natural law upon the natural consciousness of the natural man. Fallen man possesses the ability to know God's standards of law and government. Winston Churchill observed that the American War of Independence was an extension of the English Revolution. The subsequent signing of the English Petition of Rights in 1629 and the English Bill of Rights in, in 1689. The, Engl the English Revolution was an attempt to preserve the rights earlier sustained by Runnymede Meadow with the signing of the Magna Carta, but reaching back even further, the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215 reinforced common law even further. Rights that, that he had existing, exist, existed in an old Anglo Saxon England. And as important as all these events are, none, of, none are the source of our common law liberties. God is sovereign over all the affairs of men. He is a source of liberties that emanate by his grace from the fountainhead of his person and eternal world with which the ideals of the common law tradition are consonant. After the Norman invasion of um, 1066, Rome devised schemes and attempted to manipulate or force England to adapt civil law. Impelled by different forces, the struggle continues even today in common law jurisdictions such as England and the United States, the persistent in, in encroachment of administrative law. We are a Christian nation. The battle we fought and continue to fight today is a spiritual one. At the time of the American War of Independence, the population of American colonies was approximately 3 million souls, while some 8 million residents resided in England. Of the roughly 3 million persons residing in the colonies, about one-third were English and English Anglicans, Puritans, or Congressionalists, and another third were Scot Scots Irish Presbyterians, and third were German and, and Dutch, or, Luther or Lutheran and Reformed churches. Roman churches devotees con con continued approximately one and a half percent of the colonial population. About two about two tenths of one percent was Jewish. Jewish traces traces of other Protestant groups made up the remaining population. Because of Protestant culture, cultures, persuasive scriptural influence throughout the American colonies, the colonists held natural natural affinity for the common law's fundamental principles. Owing to their spiritual influence, the reform the reform Protestant tradition advanced a government similar in kind to the common laws white, white and written. A plurality of elders or assembly of men, eldership or presbyters, to which an executive or administrative officer must answer and, and independent judges. However, 
Both the pres both precedent and the common law traditions demanded adherence to law as the eternal idea, as opposed to any any contemporary and capricious decrees of mere men. Consequently, Americans have traditionally believed that the rules of law and their measured applications are discoverable through seeking them, not manufactured by the mind of man. Both both traditions held that governments administered by men are limited, since only God is sovereign and the true sense of unlimited jurisdiction. They believed that opportunities for appeal must not only exist within the government but also as a matter of matter of individual individual um conscience and practice beyond the state in other words each individual is free and responsible to appeal directly to his creator for justification of his intentions and actions further both maintain the importance of distinguishing and separ and separating the fundamental offices of government and a general decentralization of distribu distrib distribution and authority. In order to understand Anglo-American common law, a tolerable understanding of the English legal profession is necessary. Leaders of the colonial American bar were English barristers trained in the English inns of court. At the time of American independence in 1776, approximately 100 Americans were studying common law in the English inns of, inns of court, more, than, more American than English students, and their influence in America has been substantial. Compared with the, compared with the mother country of 3 million for training and bringing home common lawyers in a greater proportion, through these men, the common law ex exerted a significant impact upon our inception as a nation. John Rutledge, among the justices appointed to the first, Ingl the first United States Supreme Court in 1789, obtained his legal training in the English Inns of Court. Twenty-five common lawyers signed the Declaration of Independence and 31 of the 35 signers of our Constitution were common lawyers. However, at least 51 and possibly 52 of these 55 signers were the evangelical protestants. American colonials were sensitive to common law dignities to a degree that some, that some in England did not appreciate. About the time of American independence, Blackstone's com commentaries on the American law appeared, selling more copies in the American colonies that were sold in England. During America's 18th century colonial days, the common law had reached its zenith of interrogation and expression in conscious consonance with the scripture. The motivation inspiring the American war for independence is attributable to the high, high level of American interest in common law precepts as a biblical worldview of relationships and political government. The inten this intensity of American interest informed and sustained by William Blackstone's com commentaries on the laws of England continued for many decades following her independence. Blackstone's commentaries remain the best source available for the common law's development and the middle and, and at the middle of the 18th, 18th century. Therefore, it is the duty of the sheriff to protect and support the law of the land, aka the common law. Failure to do so is a violation of their oath. History of the sheriff. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Abraham Lincoln. The county sheriff is the last line of defense when it comes to upholding and defending the Constitution. The sheriff's duties and obligations go far beyond arresting criminals and operating jails. The sheriff also has an obligation to protect the constitutional rights of the citizen and in our countries. This includes the right to free speech the right to assemble, and the right to bear arms. Delayed liberty and our very way of life are under attack, because we the people are ignorant to the true law of the land and our history. We have lost our way. It is not until we start to read about what we have inherited from our founding fathers that we start to realize how far we have drifted from the blessings of liberty. But there is hope. There is a grassroots movement across America building committees of safety 
to restore our American way of life. And if we reach our 3,100 plus American county sheriffs to work with the people to restore our constitution, we can save America from self-destruction. Remember your oath. Sheriffs took an oath to uphold and defend the constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. In the history of our world, it is government tyranny, tyranny that has violated the freedoms granted us by our creator more than any other. And it is the duty of the sheriff to protect their countries from those that would take away our freedoms, both foreign and domestic. Whether it is a terrorist from Yemen or a bureaucrat from Washington, D.C. While most people in America recognize the sheriff as chief law enforcement officer, Cleo, for the, for the county, they, they would be surprised to know that the office of the sheriff has a proud history that spans well over a thousand years, from the early Middle Ages to our own high-tech era. The beginning, the middle, the beginning, the Middle Ages. More than 1,300 years ago in England, small groups of Anglo Saxons lived in rural communities similar to modern-day towns. Often at war, they decided to better organize themselves for defense. Sometime before the year 700, they formed a system of, of local self-government based on groups of ten. Each of the towns divided into groups of ten families called Tithin. Each Tithin elected, elected a leader called a Tithin man. The next, levels of government, next level of government was a group of ten Tithlings or 100 families. And this group elected its own chief. The Anglo-Saxon word for chief was Jephiria, later shortened to Reeve. During the next two centuries, groups of hundreds banded together to form a new, higher unit of government called the Shire. The Shire was the forerunner of the modern country. Each Shire had a chief, Reeve, as well, and the more powerful official became known as the Shire Reeve. The word Shire Reeve became the modern English word Sheriff, the chief of the county. The Sheriff maintained law and order within his own country and the assistance of the citizens. When the sheriff sounded the hue and cry that a criminal was at large, anyone who heard the alarm was responsible for bringing the criminal to justice. This principle of citizen participation survives today in the procedure known as posse committanus. The office grows. English government eventually became more centralized under the power of a new of a single ruler, the king. The king distributed large tracts of land to noble, noblemen who governed the land through the king's authority. The office of sheriff was no longer elected but appointed to the noblemen for the counties they enrolled. In which, in those areas not co-signed to noblemen, the king appointed his own sheriffs. After the Battle of Hastings in 1066, England's rule fell to the Normans, France, who seized and centralized all power under the Norman, Norman kings and his appointees. The sheriff became the agent of the king, and among his new duties was tax collection. This dictation or rule by a series of powerful kings became intolerable, and in 1215 an army of rebellious noblemen for, forced the despotic king, John, to sign the Magna Carta. This important document restored a number of rights to the noblemen and guaranteed certain basic freedoms. The text of the Magna Carta mentioned the important role of the sheriff nine times. The sheriff crosses the Atlantic. The first American counties were established in Virginia, and records show that the first American sheriff was a Virginia sheriff, beginning a continuing tradition when the Virginia House of Burgresses appointed the first eight first eight sheriffs in the first eight counties of the New World in 1634. One of these counties elected a sheriff in 1651. Most other colonial sheriffs were appointed, just as the noblemen in medieval England, England and large American landowners appointed sheriffs to enforce the law in the areas they controlled and to protect their lands. American sheriffs were not expected to pay extraordinary expenses. However, some actually made money from the job. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, colonials and state legislators assigned a broad range of responsibilities to the sheriff, which included the familiar role of law enforcement. 
Other duties were new, such as overseeing jails, houses of corrections, and workhouses. As Americans moved westward, so did the office of sheriff and the use of jails. Settlers desperately needed sheriff to establish order in the lawless territories where power belonged to those with the fastest draw and the most accurate shot. Most western sheriffs, however, hit the peace by virtue of their authority, with a few, few exceptions. Sheriffs were resorted to firepower much less often than we have seen depicted in movies and on TV. The Sheriff Today There are over 3,100 countries in the United States, counties in the United States, and almost every one of them has a sheriff, except for Alaska. Some cities such as Denver, St. Louis, Richmond, and Baltimore have sheriffs, have sheriffs as well. The office of sheriff is established either by state constitution or by an act of state legislature. They are, there are only two states in which the sheriff is not elected by the voters. In Rhode Island, sheriffs are appointed by the governor. In Hawaii, deputy sheriffs serve in the Department of the Public Safety Sher Sheriff's Division. There's really no such thing as a typical sheriff. Some sheriffs still have time to drop by the town coffee shop and chat with the citizens each day while others report to an office in a skyscraper and manage a department whose budget exceeds that of many corporations. However, most sheriffs have certain roles and responsibilities in common. We the people, governments are instituted among men, deriving, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. For more information and free constitutional course and civis, civics course, visit www.powerofthecountysheriff.org. Alright guys, that's it. Once again, I'll leave the link down in the description box below. Or if you email, you email us at themoneygmo.com for private home station. I'll see you guys next video. Like, share, subscribe, and have a nice day.